Good morning or afternoon or evening, party people, depending on where you're watching this. I'm Brent Ozar, Microsoft Certified Master, which just means I've made a lot of expensive mistakes with my SQL Server career, and now I get to help you avoid some of those same mistakes. If you've got questions for me about the Microsoft Data Platform, you can click the link in the video description, uh, and then it should say like and subscribe, uh, so that you get, click the little bell to make sure you get notifications whenever I have a new one of these go live. So the first question that y'all upvoted, let's see here, Neil asks, is it dangerous or risky to expand a drive in Azure with SQL data files on it? I don't know what happens behind the scenes. Okay, from a, a, like a data risk perspective, it's not risky, but often, see, Azure drives are usually performance-based based on their size, not on how fast you need them to go. And so often what you'll have to do is pool several drives together in order to get the performance that you need, like stripe the data across all of them. So I get really nervous when someone says, my data is growing because also your performance usually needs to grow around the same time as well. And if you're only growing the size and not the performance, that's a recipe for slowdowns over time. So if you want to learn more about that, go check out my running SQL Server in Amazon and Azure class. If you go to brentozar.com and click training up at the top, um, I've got information about how you size those kinds of things for performance, not just for uh, capacity. Next up, Brett asks, I'm a consultant at a large, large cloud provider. I have to protect my job and not upset our customers too much. How do you recommend balancing the line when you deliver bad news? Uh, search for Brent Ozar Consulting Lines. Brent Ozar Consulting Lines. And I've got a series of blog posts uh, that talk about how I deliver bad news and how I coach clients through that kind of thing. Brent Ozar Consulting Lines. Madison asks, does Postgres handle XML and JSON data any better than SQL Server? I have no idea. We actually store uh, XML and JSON data in Postgres to some extent with SQL Constant Care. Just when we do it, we don't uh, analyze the XML or JSON in the database server any differently than I would do in SQL Server. You don't analyze it. You pull it out in the application, do whatever slicing and dicing you need in the application. Remember, the database server is the most expensive place in the shop that you have to store and analyze data. Don't do any extra work in there if you can avoid it. Do it in the least expensive platform. Next up, Tobias asks, what is your opinion of the new buffer pool parallel scan feature in SQL Server 2022? When is this a compelling reason to upgrade? So let's say you're bringing out a new version of something. And you're kind of starved for marketing material. You got a list of features, and that feature list isn't as long as you like. And you're looking around, and you're like, what else can we say is cool? You might have to promote something that's really more of a fix than a new feature. It might have been hard for you to code that fix, but that doesn't make it a big feature, especially in the day and age where a relatively small percentage of customers have over, say, half a terabyte of RAM, and that this feature isn't used feature, see, even I fall into it. This hotfix really doesn't come into effect in that many situations. I think that it got blown out of proportion when it's something that most people will never hit. Yes, when they do hit it, it would be a big deal, but it's just more of a bug fix to me than a feature. Uh, next up, Theodore says, what is your opinion on the Microsoft Azure Premium V2 cloud storage improvements? Okay, look, sometimes I get a reputation for kind of like pooping on Microsoft, but here's the thing. I feel the same way about Amazon, uh, Amazon storage and Google storage. This improvement is still worse than what you can buy from Amazon, like the retail store, not the cloud provider, for like $200. 
For like $200, you can get bigger, faster drives. Not bigger in 64 terabytes. That's a different thing altogether. Just because you go to 64 terabytes doesn't mean you get big performance. You're still stuck with those same performance numbers that you see there. For $200, you can get a faster drive that does more megabytes a second and has less latency, more throughput, more operations per second, everything, uh, than what you get up in either Amazon, Azure, Google, whatever. Um, so I think that oh, great welcome to 2006 SSDs. So you know it's hard for me to get excited about that. Uh, Yitrick says, uh, what kind of performance issues have you run into with SQL change tracking? I haven't. So for me, very often when someone comes to me and says we're having all these problems, if change tracking and change data capture are high up on their performance bottlenecks, what I usually do is ask them, okay, why? Why are we running CDC or change tracking? And often they'll say, well, we, we have to offload our reports because performance is so bad in production, to which point I can say, wait a minute, performance is bad in production because you're doing CDC and change tracking. This doesn't happen very often, but when it is a performance problem, usually we step back and we go, okay, so how about if we just did something like always on availability groups where you can read from the secondary with way less overhead than things like CDC and change tracking. I'm not saying CDC and change tracking are always bad ideas. <coughs> They're wonderful when you only need a small portion of the database. But where I run into it as performance problems is where somebody thought it was like a candy store, like everything was going to be free. They're like, I want to track this table and this table and this table, and I want to pull it all the time. And I'm like, okay, I'm sure you do. But if you want most of the database, that's what AGs are for. Next up, DBA in hiding says, after 10 years of being a production support DBA, I moved to being a developer with T-SQL and SSIS for five years. I still tinker. I'd like to go back to being a DBA, but will my recent dev track be seen as an asset or a hindrance? You're overthinking it. If you've been working with data for 15 years, you have references. And I don't mean that you're just going to call them for like help with your resume. You're going to give them your resume and say, I'm looking for work. Here's the kind of work that I'd like to do. Because if you've been working with, with data for 15 years, you got a pretty good list of contacts. You should be able to call back those contacts that you've worked with in the past, and they should want to work with you. If they don't want to work with you, if you think back through everybody that you've worked with and you're like, I don't want to work with them, and they would probably wouldn't want to work with me, and this isn't really a good fit, then it's not your resume that's holding you back. And I'll just kind of leave you there, that there for a second. Ephraim says, what kinds of conditional debug message and printing pro procs do you, or techniques do you like to use in your stored procedures? You know, this is one of those phishing questions that it's like, hey, tell me how to be a better developer. And while I, while I totally admire that question, it's not really a good fit for office hours because like, tell me how to do something. And that's just kind of beyond the scope of, here's a question, here's an answer real quick. So what do I like to do? I like to print, I like to raise error. Now, if you want me to give examples of those, that's where training classes come in, for example. Next up, Pajama Rama says, uh, Hi, Brant, we've got 2014 with large amounts of multiple plans. I used your query to find the top 10 queries involved. Good. They are select statements by our Power Builder application. Parameter sniffing, what do you suggest we do? Oh, you mean the, so that article there, why multiple plans are bad? The ones that's got instructions in there for you to how to fix it? Yeah, I want you to read it. the more you know. Uh, next up, Magnus says, which Windows Server admin concepts and technologies should a SQL DBA be familiar with when running SQL Server 2019 on a 2019 cloud VM? Okay, so what do you have to do? In some companies, the Windows admins, the Windows team, they build the Windows VM and they hand it to you. The bigger company that you get, the more that starts to become siloed, like the Windows admins will do everything and you don't even have permissions on Windows. All, they may even install SQL Server for you and you just get SQL Server logins. So it depends on the kinds of company that you're with. If you're the only sysadmin and you're doing database administration tasks, then you're going to have to know how to do everything in terms of systems 
administration. The larger of a company you work with, if there are more Windows people, then they take care of more of the day-to-day -day Windows administration tasks. The, just off the top of my head, Installation, configuration, security, and troubleshooting. Those are the most common things that you have to think about. Uh, Hadar asks, what are the most common mistakes you see regarding the use of cursors? The funny answer would be to say, using them, but um, uh, But I think it's, it's more along the lines of when people use cursors, they don't realize that every operation in the cursor is done one at a time. So if you're looping over, you know, 100 rows, you're running every query in that cursor 100 times. And so it's just thinking row-based instead of thinking set based? What's an easier way to just apply this change across all 100 rows? Usually when I see people doing it, they're like, well, I have to call this stored procedure once for each row. I'm like, okay, great. So we've now found the problem is that the stored procedure doesn't take a list of IDs or it doesn't take a, an order ID with all its line items. Could you conceivably rewrite that stored procedure so that it works set based? If the answer is no, okay, you got to use cursors. That is what it is. But it's also a sign that we have technical debt, that we've written something that isn't going to scale long term. Uh, next up, Jagelman says, my friend needs a reporting database on RDS. He plans to use replication. Whoop, timeout, flag on the field. Um, with RDS, you can have readable replicas. It's, if I remember right, I'm, I might be wrong about that because it's been a while since I've looked at RDS for readable replicas. Um, but And it is dependent on you have to have Enterprise Edition and you have to be using a version of SQL Server that supports availability groups. Um, well, and you are with 2016, so that's true. Um, the, the other thing that I would say is I'm not really a fan of replication with RDS. I've had a couple of customers try to use it, and because with RDS the server names can change, as they replace replicas underneath you when they run into problems, when they do that, that can break replication. That's one of the many things about RDS with replication that I'm just not that big of a fan of. Um, so he says the table's partitioned, has no primary key, blah, 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 blah. The way that I would would uh, go to it is as soon as you start saying, I need readable replicas, that's your sign that you want to be using uh, availability groups instead and offloading queries to the read replicas. Much easier solution. Next up, Hans says, hi, I'm five years into my DBA career, and I've never had to deal with any complex corruption issues. Oh, I hope you knocked on wood when you said that. Um, is it still an important skill? I'm thinking of complex corruption as something more than just doing backup and restore. Um, important skill is tricky. How would I say it's probably like changing a flat tire. It's, it's pretty, it's actually a pretty good analogy. Does everybody in the year 2022 need to know how to change a flat tire? Flat tires are not going to happen to most of us. And when they do happen, there are people you can call. You can call AAA. You can call your auto insurance. They usually have some kind of roadside service. Uh, you can call a tow truck. They'll come out and replace it for you. They'll mount the spare for you. You don't have to know how to change a flat tire. But if you want to get to your destination as quickly as possible, if the company believes that they're going to have you handle everything instead of having someone else handle it, then you may want to know how to fix a flat tire. I don't even do corruption cases anymore because the problem with corruption cases as a consultant is I don't know how long it's going to take. I can't just say to somebody, I'm going to bill you by the hour until this is done because I got other clients booked. I'm usually booked in advance for a certain period of time. And if someone comes running in with a corruption case, they need it fixed right away. I don't have 48 straight hours of availability. Some cases can be fixed in 15 minutes. Some of them take days in order to accomplish, especially on larger databases with slow restore times. So I end up having a, a stock uh, a blog post that I send people to, brentozar.com slash go slash corruption. And I'm like, here's the checklist that you use in order. And that's not about you fixing the corruption. That's about calling companies for help, things like Microsoft. 
So I, I, I certainly wouldn't distinguish between DBA job candidates based on who knew how to, to fix corruption and who didn't. I think it's a cool skill to have, kind of like changing a flat tire. But if I'm interviewing an Uber driver, if I'm getting ready to get in some Uber driver's car, do I want to ask him if he knows how to change a flat tire? Nah, it's just not really relevant most of these times. Uh, Yousef asks, what is your opinion of Azure Cosmos DB for Postgres? I haven't used it. I think that if you're going to pick a database, databases are like the most important part about your application. If something breaks about that database, your application is toast. If the vendor decides to discontinue that database, the application is toast. If they don't support all the latest and greatest features, it's toast. So if you're starting with something that supports reverse compatibility of something, I get nervous betting the farm on that. And I know that sounds weird because I'm really into Aurora Postgres, but Amazon Aurora Postgres is Postgres with just a different storage engine under the covers. I don't think that that's true for Azure Cosmos DB. I think that it's got restrictions on things like data types. I'm not sure about that, but that was just from the first read, read that I did the first time it came out. Didn't support all query capabilities, didn't support all data types. And I was like, ah, ah I get nervous about that. And then we'll take one more. Let's see here. Can having a uniqueifier, Yitchak asks, can having a uniqueifier hidden column on clustered indexes affect query plans and query performance? Yes. And I teach you more about that in my class, Mastering Index Tuning. I teach you how to see what that overhead is, for example. All right, we've been going for a little over 15 minutes here. We will call it quits on this office hours. I'll go ahead and erase out the cues. So if you uh, asked a question recently and I didn't get to it, that's because nobody else upvoted it. Might tell you that you want to improve your question for next time. Uh, or team up all your friends and get them all to upvote your question. So I will see you all at the next office hours. Adios.